as I mentioned to you uh, a little bit earlier, we are going to be continuing in our present series entitled Seven Things Christians Believe That the Bible Doesn't Necessarily Say. And today we're going to talk about how that Christians widely believe that God is coming back in his wrath to judge the world. And he's going to wipe it out and destroy it. And all non-Christians, of course, will, will go to hell. So I want to deal with that because I believe that's uh, not true and that the Bible doesn't say that. And so uh, here we go. I'm going to begin by sharing a quick story with you about a film that came out in the 70s, yes, I am that old, <laughs> called Thief in the Night. This was, quote, a Christian film, and it was, it was created to scare the hell out of people. <laughs> it was a Christian film that talked about the rapture, and uh, that's what its various scenes and so forth displayed and uh, we're all about is showing people having to leave the earth and be taken from the earth, showing Christians, of course, taken from the earth and unbelievers left. And, of course, uh, it, it was very scary. I remember as a young person, I was still in my teens, renting that movie, setting up a meeting place, and inviting people to come and watch that movie with the specific purpose of scaring them so that I could give an invitation to accept Jesus. Maybe you've heard of this movie. And of course, at the time, it's very B-roll now. It's not even that good. Uh, but at the time, it was something. And it did an effective job of scaring a lot of people into confessing Jesus as their Savior. It'd be interesting to know how many of them are still Christians today. Similarly, I'm going to scare the hell out of you this morning. Well, in a, in a word, I want to talk about, for just a moment, a man by the name of Jonathan Edwards. He was an American revivalist preacher, philosopher, and congregationalist theologian. He was a leading fi figure in the American Enlightenment, widely regarded as, as Wide, widely regarded as one of America's most important and original philosophical theologians. Edwards was just 37 years old when he preached his most celebrated sermon. And he preached it on July 8, 1741. And it became standard text and require, required reading in Christian colleges throughout the world. The sermon was entitled, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Now, I don't have a recording of that sermon, of him preaching that sermon. Of course, that technology wasn't available. But the sermon has been reenacted. And I, I think very much like this revivalist preacher would have preached it. I'm going to share with you two minutes of this sermon. All right, because I want you to get an idea of what it was that Jonathan Edwards used to scare the hell out of people. I want to give you an idea of the kind of material that became standard reading and required reading. It, it was in the libraries of every Christian pastor for the most part, especially here in America. And it was just the de facto standard for how to preach a sermon and get effective results. Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God by Jonathan Edwards. Is nothing but his mere pleasure that keeps you from being this moment 
swallowed up in everlasting destruction. The god that holds you over the pit of hell much as one holds a spider or some loathsome insect over the fire abhors you and is dreadfully provoked. His wrath towards you burns like fire. He looks upon you as worthy of nothing else but to be cast into the fire. He is of purer eyes than to bear to have you in his sight. You are ten thousand times so abominable in his eyes as the most hateful venomous serpent is in ours. You have offended him infinitely more than ever a stubborn rebel did his prince. And yet is nothing but his hand that holds you from falling into the fire every moment. Tis to be ascribed to nothing else that you did not go to hell the last night that you were suffered to awake again in this world after you closed your eyes to sleep and there is no other reason to be given why you have not dropped into hell since you arose in the morning but that God's hand has held you up. There is no other reason to be given why you have not gone to hell since you have sat here in the house of God provoking his pure eyes by your sinful wicked manner of attending his solemn worship Yea, there is nothing else that is to be given as a reason why you don't this very moment drop down into hell. <laughs> Woo! Well, so, as Brian Zahn said in his response to this, lovely, isn't it? God depicted as a sadistic juvenile dangling spiders over a fire. Welcome to God's torture chamber, the Almighty's eternal Auschwitz. That's from Brian's book, which is a res direct response to this sermon, and I'm going to put up a picture of the cover of it here. Brian Zong is the author. Please, you should have this book in your library. Talk about something you should have in your library. Sinners in the Hands of a Loving God. Okay? Well, let's talk about wrath, vengeance, and sacrifice because it's a very twisted view of God. I want to give you three misunderstandings this morning. Three misunderstandings regarding wrath, vengeance, and sacrifice. The first one is that God judges people for their sin. The second one is that there has to be a sacrifice, a bloody sacrifice for sin. And then the third one that I'm going to talk about this morning is how that before God can before Jesus can come back, I mean God's going to come in his wrath and judge the entire world. Is any of that true? When we talk about the wrath of God, we learned last week that we're actually talking about the cruciform consent of God. Whenever you read about wrath in the Bible, it's really talking about the cruciform consent of God. It's sort of pulling back, taking his hands off a thing, not him directly willing it. Judgments in Scripture are real. It's all about how God judges. God hates everything that hurts people. The Bible says God hates divorce. Why? Because divorce hurts people. And the assumption of all Old Testament writers was the same as the culture around them, that when God judges, he turns to violence. They even believed that they were praising God when they gave credit to God for the violence that was being done. It was a sort of a cultural expression. My God's bigger than your God. And so my God can wipe out your situation, your people, your community, your nation. 
My God's bigger than your God. It was all about violence. And that was very cultural at the time. And the Old Testament writers certainly picked up on that. that. That was their view of God. They introduced that into their understanding of God. The church throughout history, in fact, has followed this same violent punishing God, this punishing God, God's a punishing God motif. The Crusades, where three million were wiped out and slaughtered. The French War, three million the Taiping Rebellion, 20 million people wiped out. This was a religious war. Nationalism and holy war that's going on even in our own country today with our own politicians. Don't think that it isn't tied into this same ugly idea of God's wrath and vengeance. Now the Bible says that the cross is how God judges sin. Not violence. Jesus suffered the death consequences of sin on the cross. And we last week pointed out how we could call this the vicarious exchange rather than a penal substitution. All the violence that was done at the cross, because I know it was bloody, I know that it was violent, I know that it was shameful, I know it was the darkest and ugliest of human events. It was meant to be. It was a Roman method of torturing people and doing it in such a way that the onlookers would not repeat the offense. It was violent. It was ugly. It's just that God did not do it. God, in his cruciform consent, consented to allow Jesus to be crucified on the cross. And all the violence that was done at the cross wasn't done by God. Rather, it was done by humans under the influence of powers, social, religious, demonic powers. It was an example of God's divine consent. Romans chapter 8, verse 32 says this, He who did not spare his own son, watch the language here, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously, gracefully, or graciously, excuse me, give us all things? The message translation of that verse says this. God didn't hesitate to put everything on the line for us, embracing our condition, and watch this, exposing himself to the worst by sending his own son. Remember, the cross is where God climbs into our darkness, our ugliness, our brokenness. He consumed the virus of death and sin when he was there on that cross. Every darkness, every dark power, Christ incinerates the virus of sin by his divine glory. By taking it, the word became flesh, and that flesh body took into it the wrath of sin, the virus of sin, and canceled it. It wasn't wrath appeasing. It wasn't a sacrifice God required. It was something that Jesus did out of God's consent to demonstrate his love. In fact, look at this. Romans chapter 4 and verse 25 says, He was handed over because of our sin, not for our sin. There's a difference. Romans chapter 4 verse 25, Who was handed over because of our trespasses, not for and raised because of our justification. Not for, because if he did it for, then there's something outside of God's mercy that forgives us and justifies us. See, I'm justified by faith. I'm forgiven by his mercy. Not by appeasing God through a blood sacrifice. The one and only action that God took towards Jesus was to give him over. God allowed the consequence of sin on Jesus. God gives you the choice to choose death if you want to. I might say to you this, it's impossible to embrace the scandal and the beauty of God's cruciform love while one remains married to the idea of an angry God who must satisfy his wrath and justice through punishment. The second critical thing here in why I believe wrath and punishment 
and sacrifice are all a twisted view of God is because God does not require bloodletting. Jesus is spoken of as the lamb and a sacrifice. But it's not because God required bloodletting. Let's look. John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 29. Jesus is called the Lamb of God. I'm reading from the Mirror translation. The next day John saw Jesus approaching him, and he declared, Behold, the Lamb of God. This is the one who would lift the sin of the cosmos like an anchor from the seafloor for mankind to sail free. Folks, this is unheard of. This is completely flipping the idea of sacrifice as it's known in the Old Testament. It's not about a vengeful God demanding sacrifice. This is our heavenly Father and Creator providing Jesus Himself. This is our Father providing the sacrifice Himself. Who did He provide it for? We were the ones who received the sacrifice. Is it a sacrifice of appeasement? No. Francois continues in his footnote here, the ultimate sacrifice for sin would never be something we did or brought to God as an appeal to him. The shocking scandal of the cross is the fact that mankind is confronted with the extravagant, embarrassing proportions of the love of their maker, father, son, and spirit, would go to the most ridiculous extreme to finally convince us of their heart towards us. People have fixed their attention on two passages that use a theological term called propitiation, atoning sacrifice. And you tie that into the bloodletting of the Old Testament and all of a sudden God was killing Jesus as a sacrifice because in his anger and wrath and his vengeance, his justice demands blood as payment for sin. That's the whole Christian theme of Western evangelicalism. But what a wrong example of a translation. Let, let me give you one that's just in your face. This is the Disciple Literal New Testament. The Disciples Literal New Testament translation. Listen, who God set forth as that which satisfies his wrath through faith in his blood. Who God set forth as that which satisfies his wrath through faith in his blood. That is such a poor translation. No, no, no. That is not the word propitiation. That's how some have translated it and thought about it. Let me show you the two passages that use it. Here we go. Romans chapter 3 and verse 25. And 1 John chapter 2 and verse 2, which say, God publicly displayed him at his death as the mercy seat accessible through faith. And 1 John, and he is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but for the sins of the read it. Whole world. Who sins? The whole world. See, your personal sin is not the issue. Not even why Jesus died. He died to redeem the cosmos, the entire world, all of humanity. From what? The virus of sin. The mere translation says it this way. Jesus is our at one meant. That's what atonement means. Not bloody sacrifice, becoming one with God. How does he accomplish that? He gives over. He yields in his cruciform consent his own precious son who has conciliated us to himself and has taken our sins and distortions out of the equation. Take a second look just for a moment in your minds, if you would, at the Old Testament example of sacrificial animals when they would bring two goats as sin sacrifice. There were two. Now, here's what they did with the first one. Watch this. The first one was an offering of thanks for the covenant that, that they had with God. And so they laid their hands on the goat, not as punishment or, or penalty for sin, 
And then that goat was offered as thanksgiving. It wasn't given as wrath satisfaction, but only as an offering of thanks. That was the first goat. Then the second goat, they laid their hands, the priests laid their hands on that goat, confessing the sins of the people, and then they took the goat outside of the temple yard and released it and let it go into the wilderness. It wandered off. Presumably it died in the wilderness. But not as punishment. Do you remember a scripture going something like this? As far as the east is from the west, so has the Lord removed your sin and will not remember it. Why? Because he requires punishment? He requires a bloody sacrifice? No. Exactly the opposite. He does not require a blood sacrifice. No bloodletting. The goat just goes off into the wilderness. That's even the Old Testament type of sacrifice. And then we have the third one. And I'm going to call this no more wrath no more judgment. All humankind is released. See, it's a misunderstanding to think or to say or to believe that God is coming again, sending Jesus back. He's got these flaming swords coming out of his mouth and he's going to wipe out all the unbelievers and the blood's going to run so deep it's up to the bridle of the horses. <laughs> these are all pictures from primarily Ezekiel Daniel and the book of Revelation. Oh my goodness, do we need a new reading of those books and a new reading of Revelation. No, what we're talking about here is no more wrath, no more judgment. All of humankind is included in the cruciform love of God. I want to quote John Chehak here, or Sihak. He says, in the ugliest place of human existence, that is crucifixion and death, God reveals himself as absolute, total, self-giving love. Being disguised under the disfigurement of an ugly crucifixion and death, the Christ form is paradoxically the clearest revelation of who God is. What is atonement? It's just a theological term for how humans are rescued from their plight and restored to their intended place within the loving and creative purposes of God. And it's not just you personally. That's not why Jesus came, to forgive your sins. He came to redeem the entire cosmos, to deal with the virus of sin, so that all humanity could re be redeemed to the loving, creative purposes of God. What a scheme. What a scheme, this idea of heaven and hell. It's so Western eschatology. Over the course of the 19th and 20th centuries, in particular, Western evangelicalism has taken us back once more to the medieval heaven and hell eschatology, which has radically redefined both scriptural teaching on Christ's purpose and his mission. What am I talking about? How we are saved, number one. And then what's the central message that we should carry? Rather than the focusing on God's kingdom coming to earth as it is in heaven, it became about my sin, my personal salvation, my Savior, Jesus. Sinners being saved, going to heaven was never the central message of the good news that the disciples and apostles went throughout the then known world preaching. It was about how God, through Christ, reconciled the entire world to himself and transformed us and all of creation through his resurrection from the dead. He writes, says, the bodily resurrection of Jesus was the launching of God's new creation into this present world order. The cross was the moment when something happened as a result of which the world became a different place, inaugurating God's future plan. The revolution began then and there. Jesus' resurrection was the first sign that it was indeed underway. That's what the cross was about. The cross is where Jesus was given over by God in his cruciform 
consent to take the virus of sin and condemn it in his flesh, to wipe it out, to destroy its effect and power over you. And then, for the entire cosmos, he redeemed it all back to God. Romans chapter 5, verse 8, includes all humanity in this. Watch. But God demonstrates his own love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. When did Christ die? When did Christ die? While we were yet sinners. That's before, during, and after. In fact, Paul wrote in the book of Ephesians, before the foundation of the world, the Lamb, there it is, was slain. Oh, man. That includes your friends, neighbors. That includes those individuals who you think aren't ever going to be. I mean, they'd never be included in heaven. They, I just, I mean, the way they live, I doubt God's going to include them. <laughs> really? The same love that forgave, the same mercy that forgives you your sin forgives your neighbor that fellow employee, that worker at work, that family member that's difficult to get along with, the prostitute on the street, and yes, even political figures. <laughs> now, for me, there's a rub. <laughs> because if I have a hard time trusting any of what just about all of them say. From both sides of the aisle. Doesn't matter. It's like a snake in the grass. And yet, God presented Jesus to redeem the whole of creation before the earth was even formed. Here's one, Romans chapter 6, verse 23. Now, this was part of my preaching of the Romans Road. This is how I used to condemn people. It was part of showing that movie and making sure people understood they were sinners. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. The New English translation says, For the payoff of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. As if God is standing there waiting for you to sin so that he can say, Now, that sin that's in your life, if you don't get that out of there, if you don't repent of that, there, I'm going to judge you. And if you don't repent before you die, you're going to go to eternal conscious torment. That's not what that verse says at all. Romans 3, verse 23, is an observation of the fruit of sowing and reaping, not a declaration of God's willful wrath or justice. It's a conclusion of the law of sin and death, not a consequence of God's willful judgment. Oh, and then we've we got to deal with the warrior God thing. I'll hurry. I'll, I'll do my best just to finish this out. Luke chapter 4, verse 17 through 20. Let's start reading it. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll. Let me give you the background now. Take the verse down. What I'm going to need you to do is only have a, when I'm speaking about it in particular because I don't want people to have a misunderstanding of the point. So Jesus comes into the temple one day. He's worshiping the Lord. They're singing graves unto gardens. All right? Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, that song goes all the way back to the temple courts. I mean, Jesus is standing there. Singing grave, grave, God turning graves into gardens. Right? And then they call him up at the end of the song service to do a reading. They hand him the scrolls and he opens it and it's the book of Isaiah. And so Jesus starts reading. And this is recorded in Luke's Gospel, chapter 4. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it is written. Now, here's what he's reading from, all right? The book of Isaiah. I'm, go I, I'm going to take you now to the passage in Isaiah that he was reading from. Isaiah chapter 61, verse 1 and 2. Here's that passage that he was reading. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me, because the Lord has chosen me. 
He has commissioned me to encourage the poor, to help the brokenhearted, to decree the release of captives and the freeing of the prisoners. Watch this. To announce the year of the Lord, or the year the Lord, or the the year when the Lord will show his favor, the day when our God will seek vengeance to console all who mourn. Scripture says he folded up the scroll, handed it back to the attendant, and went and sat down. Now, that was the passage he was reading from. But that's not how he read it. So as we keep reading in Luke's Gospel, chapter 4, Jesus continues to read it this way. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and regaining of sight to the blind to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, period. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fixed on him. Do you see what Jesus did? He edited the text. I read to you the actual text that he was looking at in his scroll from Isaiah. And when you get to Isaiah 61 was the passage, verse 2, it says this, to announce the year when the Lord will show his favor, the day when our God will seek vengeance. So he's reading this, and he reads it this way. Excuse me. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the, release to the captives and regaining of sight to the blind, to set it free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll. He stops reading, edits the text, doesn't read the rest of it, rolls the scroll up and hands it back to the attendant. Do you see what he did? And this was a familiar temple reading to everybody, and he stops mid-sentence. It would be like somebody singing the national anthem and ending with, Or the land of the free. And stopping, ending the song and going and sitting down. And what's the rest of that? And the home of the brave. It's the same thing. That's what he did. He's reading along, and when he gets to the part that says, the day when our God will seek vengeance, Jeff, there's a slide for this, he just doesn't read it. Look at it. He lines it out. Why? Because the day of the Lord is there. He is the day of the Lord. And with his coming, he's our propitiation. He's the mercy seat. There is no more judgment. God is not a vengeful God. They wrote him up as one in the Old Covenant, but he ain't. <laughs> All right? And so we have Paul's treatise on this, Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19. For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself no longer counting people's sins against them. I love how Brian ends in his comment about all of this. He says, We must constantly resist the temptation to cast ourselves in the role of those who deserve mercy while casting those outside our circle in the role of those who deserve vengeance. Jeff, if you would, put up that first question. We're just going to go right to the questions and then Nina's going to come and help us with closing our service here. What's that first question, Jeff? What is another way, everybody? Come on. Those of you out in the live stream, text us or type into the chat window there your response to this question. 
What is another way of referring to the wrath of God? How might we better understand it? Anybody? Okay, judgment. It's re what is a better way of referring to it? We started by saying and admitting judgments are in the Bible. Judgments are real. You can't remove judgment from the Bible. But what is that judgment? How did God judge the world? The cross. I'm not trying to catch you. It's not gotcha. <laughs> right? The cross. And what do we call God giving Jesus over? His cruciform consent. What do you do as a parent when a child just continues willfully going against a boundary? Isn't there a point at which... Now, some parents will just beat the daylights out of their kid. God, that's what we do with God. God's violence. He'll just beat you into submission. No. He takes his hands off. And part of God's love was to consent to turning Jesus over to the wrath of the cross. Not God's wrath. The wrath of the cross. Which was man's wrath. The wrath of demons. Next question, please. How has God judged the sin of the whole world? Not just our sin. Through the cross, thank you. Yes, we had just said that, didn't we? Yeah. Absolutely. Next question. Propitiation and atoning sacrifice are big theological terms. What is an easier and more accurate way of saying these expressions? Thank you. Thank you. Mercy seat. Yes, mercy seat. Remember the scripture? God publicly displayed him at his death as the mercy seat. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. Wouldn't that change your evangelism methods if you started seeing everybody as already forgiven? and part of the family. <laughs> Next question, Jeff. Nina's getting ready to come. She's going to close our service here with some prayers. Next question says this. In which gospel is a passage of Scripture which completely nullifies the idea of God executing the vengeance or executing vengeance on the world? In which gospel is that passage? Anybody? Let me see if I see it. What did we read towards the close of the sermon where we went in and Jesus actually edited? Remember, he was reading from the scroll, he was reading down through Isaiah, and he intentionally left off the last part editing the scripture. Jesus, who supersedes the scripture, he's the word of God, not the Bible. Jesus edits the Bible. Luke. Luke chapter 4. And so, this last one, so God looks like, yes, God looks like Jesus. God has always looked like Jesus. There's never been a time where God didn't look like Jesus. We didn't always know it, but now we do.